My name is Marianne Rockwell. This is Poets Talk Poetry, where I invite a poet to read two poems, one by another poet they admire and one of their own. Today, I'm talking with Jordan Smith. Jordan is the author of eight full-length books of poems, most recently, Little Black Train, winner of the Three Mile Harbor Press Prize, Claire's Empire, a Fantasia on the life and work of John Clare from the Hydroelectric Press, and The Light in the Film from the University of Tampa Press. He has also worked on several collaborations with artist Walter Hatkey, including What Came Home and Hat and Key, the recipient of grants from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Ingram Merrill Foundation. He lives with his wife, Mally, in upstate New York, where he plays fiddle and is the Edward Everett Hale Junior Professor of English at Union College. Welcome, Jordan. And um, you're, you're first going to read a poem by Matthew Graham entitled, When, What Left With My Father When He Died. Can you tell us why you chose this poem to read? Sure, I did. I, I chose it because it's from uh, Matt Graham's new new book, The Geography of Poem, which is just um, a gorgeous volume, not only because of the uh, poems that are in it, as you'll hear in a minute, uh, but also because of the paintings by uh, Matthew's partner, Catherine Waters, that are included in the book. It's from Galileo Press, and it's really just a, a lovely thing to have. In that. So, um, And uh, Matt's an old friend. We met when we were in graduate school. Um, I think we knew right away that we had a couple of things in common. Really, it was like meeting one of those people with whom you feel like you've known them for a very long time, even though if you only met them that afternoon. Um, Matt and I both grew up in upstate New York. I'm from w Western New York, south of Rochester, and he's from the uh, he's from the Catskills. Um, we were both state college kids who found ourselves kind of surprised to be at a, at a, a rather elegant institution doing our graduate work, and. Um, and we had a lot of shared interests in in landscape and in music. We were both big fans of the band. And I think that that was not just a, a musical pleasure. It had to do with the lyrics and the way in which uh, there was a strong sense of, of place and history that was included in that. And I, I think that showed up in both of our poems that year when we were first working together and made us recognize uh, that we had a lot, a lot of connection between, between us. Um, and um, we've kept up, we've kept in touch over the years. Matt's been teaching uh, in Indiana for the last couple of decades. He recently retired. Um, I'm, I'm going to read a, his poem, What Left With My Father When He Died. It's a, it's a very short poem. And, it's, uh, and I read it, and well, I'll talk more later because you're going to ask me questions. But uh, I read it, and there was just the instant feeling of recognition uh, about it for me. So you ready? I'm ready, yes. Okay. What Left With My Father When He Died. Shoehorns, pocket combs, handkerchiefs, vitalis, wristwatches, safety razors, unfiltered pelmels, blackjack chewing gum, party lines, TV antennas, rotary phones, snow tires, retreads, leaded gasoline, and road maps that to his dismay, I could never refold the proper way. <laughs> it's really beautiful. Um, uh, so I found just this listing that kind of marks a, a generation um, uh, retreads. I mean, who knows? Uh, kids today are not going to know what retreads are. Uh, party lines, Vitalis. Vitalis is a hair cream. Yeah, I, I read the poem and I thought all of this stuff was either lying around in my father's on his dresser or in the garage or, you know, on the sink some, somewhere. Uh, it was just uh, instantly recognizable to me as a portrait of, the, of uh, what a man of my father's generation. And I think also of a particular class, middle class or lower middle class, uh, would have had and would have known about that uh, that way. 
And um, so it was like, uh, whenever I read this poem, I find myself walking around in my parents' house, sort of starting by my dad's dresser and walking through the porch out to the garage where the cars are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was part of the pleasure of, of, of that list part of the poem. I really do like list poems, by the way. I've committed a few myself. And, uh, you know, the pleasure, and I'll get to the back, this, back to this, I'm sure, uh, the, the pleasure of naming stuff. That way, that way. Um, and evoking a particular time, place, class kind of person simply by listing the details that mm -hmm. are there. Yes, because that's really all there is in that first stanza. Yeah. And then the, the last stanza is just this simple formal couplet. It's a real surprise, isn't it? Hitting that, you know, I, I, I was rereading the poem this, this morning and I was thinking, there, there's something Matt does when he's working with the list in the first stanza um, that didn't hit me the first couple of times I've read it. Um, but all of those names are impossible to scan. You can't put them into a metrical, a comfortable metrical pattern. And I got interested. So I look, so you've got shoehorns, which is a trophy, pocket combs, a dactyl, handkerchiefs, another dactyl, vitalis, wristwatches, safety razors. You cannot make that flow. Uh, you're in, and um, it reminded me of there's a, in Hugh Kenner's book about Ezra Pound, the pound era, and he's talking about the modernist poets and how they were trying to invent free verse. And he said, one of the things that they did, and he compares it to the, to a cubist painting where you have the areas of space in the painting very rigidly broken up and zoned uh, is the idea of subverting uh, expectation of a smooth metrical flow by deliberately use, choosing words that cannot simply be run together when you're saying them. You just can't do it, you know, physically, you just can't do it. Uh, you have to slow down. It slows you down as a yeah. reader, you know, speaker. Yeah, you look at, you look at each thing. Um, and I think that's partly why that, that really pretty couplet at the end comes as such a surprise. You hit it and suddenly, you know, and roadmaps that to his dismay, I could never refold the proper way. You know, and I whopping full rhyme there at the end of it, you know, yeah. and a uh, lovely bit of lyricism coming in unex unexpectedly. And there's so much doubleness there, like the roadmaps. And so there's the, I got from it too, the implication with all these conventional things from the first stanza, that there were expectations of th this young boy um, to take the right road or, um, you know, and to be able to fold, a, do something pragmatic, like fold a roadmap the right way. And yeah. um, so there's an affection, even though there's also, I, I thought a little uh, wanting, wanting to please dad. Kind of. Oh yeah, I think so. And it, uh, could you do it? Could you refold the roadmaps? I, I was never very good at that thing. No. Yeah, me, me no. either. And I know that my dad always could that way, that yeah. way. And, you know, and that sense of, um, fatherly expectation of order you know uh you can imagine as uh, i found myself after i was reading this poem last night i started drafting out one of my own about my father's garage because it just made, it took me back to that sense of things being where they should be mm -hmm. in order that jobs could get done properly you know so that way um and and then that kind of disappointment about you know, the kid's just not going to learn how to, he doesn't have, he doesn't have the patience or the interest or the sense of value to learn how to do this right. I can do it right. You know? <laughs> why can't he, why can't he? Um, so there's a, you know, there's a lot of, um, it, it, it's, it's it, uh, just as remarkable to me the way that in some set ways, the easy part of the poem, the list is written in that punchy separated s style. And you get to the really emotionally complicated part of the poem and he goes into that almost almost feels like a shakespearean closing couplet at the and, and at the end perhaps that to his dismay i could never fold refold the proper way are those iambic pentameters both probably well let's see and road maps that to his dismay that's an iambic tetrameter i could never you kind of have to rush that i could never right i could never then we then refold like the proper way going on too yeah like, you've got a you've got some substitutions in the first two feet the i could never but then he goes 
back to the really smooth flow and the refold the, tr- the proper way. And isn't dismay the most interesting word choice there? You know, I mean, of all the fatherly emotions that might be exhibited, uh, you know, I would think impatience or irritation or dismissal or something, but it's like, it's, it's almost an affront. You can't do that. You can't do that. Uh, uh, it's a terrific move in the poem. I just love it. And, it. and it's a world of things. We've moved away from a world of things because there's an app for things now. There's an app for everything. Right. I, you know, we use an iPhone to wake up in the morning instead of an alarm clock. Yeah. 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 And I was thinking too, I, I think it also has to do with um, the idea of what it meant to be uh, uh, a father, a, a man in the late fifties, early sixties, uh, which is where I would date this, you know, that you had to have, well, one thing you needed to have, you probably smoked, um, you uh, probably chewed gum you were responsible for the snow tires and the retreads and the levy gasoline. You had to make the choice whether you could afford new tires or whether you're going to buy retreads. I remember my dad talking about that. It's a special word there after the yeah. snow tires, right? Because it was yeah. economized. Let's economize at all costs, you know? Yeah. And, um, and the road, you know, the roadmaps, of course, and, and that sense that, you know, the, the father in the family was supposed to know how to do this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I can remember my father in the garage with a neighbor tuning up, tuning up the Rambler, you know, and um, I, he did teach me how to change spark plugs. I did manage to get that far. In fact, I was changing plugs in a pickup truck when I got the word that my first book was going to be pu- going to be published. <laughs> but, um, but I never learned the complexities of actually, you know, tuning, you know, getting out the timing light and, and looking at the carburetor and really doing that stuff. That was kind of a special mystery that required a couple of guys and a trouble light and a timing light and uh, <laughs> an afternoon and probably a couple beers afterwards. That way. Um, and, you know, I felt like I never got fully initiated to, into that. And of course, my kids never got initiated to, into that at all. since No one can fix their own car now. Right. Just go buy a new one. <laughs> no. Um, so, uh, and so there's a real sense. And of course, I think, um, you know, Matt is part of the, uh, uh, I know for a fact that, that Matt managed to get, get to Woodstock. Matt is part of that generation that, uh, my generation too, where we, where there was a lot of alienation between fathers and sons, you know, and a big shift in consciousness about, about, the world and what was what was to be loyal, what you were to be loyal to, and what was to be valued in the world, and that whole shift is right there in that stanza break. I think in the stanza break, that's yeah, point. absolutely the generation gap right there in the stanza yep. break. Well, it's well chosen, it's a beautiful poem. Um, and now you're going to read your poem with. A glass of Finger Lakes Red, and I'll let you uh, tell us if you, was there a reason why you chose this poem? Was there a reason why you, what what brought this poem into being? Talk about whatever you like about this poem. Sure. This is an elegy for my mom. She's been dead 10 years now. Um, she and my dad died within three months of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was... Um, what brought it to mind was it, it seemed to go nicely with uh, Matt's poem about his dad. Actually, the poem right ahead of that in Matt's book is an elegy for his father, too. too. Um, and it was, um, and it was also, it's also a list poem, as you see when it gets, when I get into it. Um, it has a lot to do with the names of things. Um, my mom liked to, loved to sail. She grew up on a, on a Rondequite Bay. Um, I just got a bunch of photos of the family from, uh, that my cousin discovered and, um, and there were in most of her pictures, there was either her sailboat or her dad's canoe or a dog that way. You know, I mean, she really liked the, she really loved the, uh, um, the, she loved being on the water all of her, all, all of her life. Um, they used to take me sailing in their old, old beat up snipe when I was a kid uh, we'd drive from where we lived in Fairport down to Canandaigua Lake. And I I have to admit, I found the whole thing, although I got to like sailing later, I found the whole thing terribly boring. You know, long car ride, you know, the, uh, uh, you know going out on the water, nothing much happening. Um, 
the um the thing I liked best was when we got back in and the little in the little sort of rundown marina where we kept the boat, they had a um they had a a soda machine, old fashioned soda machine. You put your coin in and then you reach down into this icy cold water to grab the so the bottle of grape soda and pull it out. Um that was that felt great after being hot all day on the lake. But what I realized when I was you know, I, I, I was grateful later when I wanted to use use boats myself that she had taught me all the stuff she taught me. And, of course, a lot of learning anything, but it's really true with sailing, is you have to learn all the names for things because someone will say, grab that grab that sheet, and you have to know the, not to look for the bed. You know, that's the... Uh, <laughs> know what um, is. So, um, so let me read it. This was a, a poem I wanted to write in memory of her. It's with a glass of Finger Lakes Red, it's for Winifred Smith, 1917 to 2011. Summer, 1964. Ten years old, drowsy, bored, in the cat's paws on Canandaigua Lake. I could hear the halyards shake, see the telltales flutter, shift as wind freshened off the shale cliffs of the Bristol Hills. The mainsail slacked, then filled. The hull heeled as we tacked. I held the jib, dead smoking, Perched on the foredeck, half on watch, to see I kept things trim. Mom had the tiller. It was her calm pleasure I remember best, repeating the words for me, the mast and gunnels, the centerboard shackle, the frayed wire stays, the booms worn tackle. Names for the boat, the light, the weather. In memory, love, and naming, tethered. She's in the low sun, bow splash, rope on the palm, waves pitch and slope. A few high cumuli barely looming. Her arm rests on the cockpit combing. And sunset is a local wine, like this one, sweet and full, entwined with shale and silt, the long thin lake, a sailboat, a mother, and their wake. Sleepy, the boy lets the jib sheet fall. The canvas luff feels the hull stall until she takes both sails in hand. Course set, no hurry, back toward land. Oh, that gives me chills. It's really beautiful. Um, and um, I, I, when I was a kid, I sailed a little, you know, we had a place, we had a little sailboat and then we had a bigger sailboat, but I like taking the little pram out. So I, I know, just to say, I know some of these terms, but not all of them. And I, I had to look up and I already forgot what that means. Um, but there's this um, kind of secret vocabulary of sailing in here that's that just it sounds so beautiful. Um, and you have uh, the again formal couplets all the way through, but it's not jarring at all the way you you've really accomplished um, it, it's it just blend they just blend in so well. Um, with the naming of things. And then I love um, the kind of turn in the poem I see as, in memory, love and naming tethered, just so beautiful. Um, and that's kind of like the turning point in, there's a lot of turning and manipulating the boat in the poem. And then there's that turn in the poem as well. And um and you're comparing the sunset to, so then you come into the present. This is my little scanning of the poem uh, and comparing the sunset that you recall to, to a Finger Lakes wine. But, but sunset is a local wine like this one, sweet and full and twined. So with, entwined with shale and silt the long thin lake, a sailboat, a mother, and their wake. Gorgeous. <laughs> Just oh, thanks so much. It was, um, yeah, I don't, I, I rarely remember after I've written a poem a great deal about the writing of the poem, you know, what, what happened in it. Um, but I know that in an, in an elegy, you know, part of the trick is to get back to the present, you know, at some point, because if the poem is going to acknowledge loss, you have to, you can't be all memory. You have to get back to where you are, you know, where you're sitting when you're thinking about it. Uh, and um, the uh, reimagining of the lost person as part of the landscape is everywhere is, you know, is I think is an essential part of what an elegy does uh, that way. Um, and it was, um, 
but of course, poem is also a bunch of words, and you know, all of those words are words that I associate with her. So she's present in the poem and all of the choices of, of um, you know, technical sailing terms that seem so esoteric when you first hear them, and then when you're used to them, they're just what you say. Yeah. Right, and you can't help but associate them with your the memory of your mother. Yeah, right. With the, I, I think that would be true with any kind of you know combination of infe- of uh, affection and instruction. You know, you would think you would associate the place and the uh, and the person and the vocabulary and the emotion together. Mm-hmm. It's it's there's so much kind of synesthesia in the poem in that way. Um, yeah, I was also playing around with the idea. Of something I, I don't have the. Uh, education or experience to really appreciate the idea that, you know, in a bottle of wine, you can taste the place that it came from. You can taste the elements of the, of, of the soil. Um, and, uh, you know, it reminded me a little of Gerard Manley Hopkins. What, um, what is the one? God bless. Uh, the, where he's naming all of the things of nature. Oh, glory to be good. To, glory be to God for dappled things. For dappled things. Yes, and I just found there's such similarity because you don't know quite what all of the things are, but you don't need to know. You can just sit back and listen to the music of it and let it wash over you. Yeah, God, what a beautiful poem that is. Well, thank you so much. Uh, do you want to share anything else about the poem or... Uh- or no i don't i don't think so i think it kind of that's what i wanted it to do which is a nice feeling when you're done with the poem it doesn't always feel that way at the end of it so, um, really? and you know as as and i should say also was a uh, you know it, it was a pleasure to write I, I think the um working with the rhyming couplets really really helped me discover the words i wanted to use and find a place for them and also gave me a little, you know, distance from the emotion that lets me work with the rhetoric of the poem, as well as as well as with the uh, sense of loss in the poem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a notion that you know a formal structure for a poem is really lend, lends itself well to deep feelings, you know, that you're working with um, when you're writing. So, well, thank you so much, Jordan. For reading. Thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate it. And for writing this poem and for talking to us. Great. And have a great day. You too, Mary. Thank you very much. Hey, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> Bye now. Bye now.